I think the reason we tell stories is to make sense of that which frightens us, to understand you know, the scary stuff in the dark, and that stories go back as far as time as a way, as a ritual of how we understand the world and understand our place in it. I thought I'd first start and tell a little about my story and what, to, what I've looked for in it that has helped shape who I am. I grew up in Canada uh, until I was about 17. And I come from a Scotch-Irish background, one side fighting Ferguson's, the other side Black McDonald's. Um, so we're pretty fierce, I guess. And uh, there was a period in the mid-90s where there were a number of these Scottish movies that came out, Braveheart, Rob Roy. And I went to see these, I saw both of these with my mother. And we came out of Rob Roy, and my mother looked very troubled and said to me, you know, I'd always imagined that we came from lovely, tea-drinking, kilt-wearing people. <laughs> and now I realize we come from these grubby, cave-dwelling marauders with bad hair. <laughs> and I thought, yes, that is probably who we came from, because otherwise, why would we have gotten on a boat and come someplace else? And um, so it's one of the stories that I think went into shaping uh, who I am. Another story from my mother that I think shaped who I am is my mother set up that reading and books and going to the library was a treat and that there was nothing more exciting than having a subscription to National Geographic. And she used to always say to me, as though we did come from Downton Abbey and not the cave dwelling people, <laughs> that our kind of people, blah, blah, blah. And she would also say to me, someone gets to do that, why not you? And the reason I'm telling this is that to think about story because the stories that are in your family, the stories that are in a country, the stories that um, are, shape a business, that these end up shaping how we think about something. One of the stories I got from my father, my dad is a man of very strong faith. And um, my sense of faith has been much more, um, well, I'll give you an example. It's a character in a play of mine an almost holy picture who every day goes out on the mesa and shouts at God, the hell with you, the hell with you. And someone asks her what she's doing, and she says, you know, I'm praying. And someone says, that's prayer. And she said, you know, I'm giving God my full attention. Isn't that prayer? <laughs> so the combination of what my father gave me with his example of strong faith and my own kind of wrestling with my own doubts ended up in my work. I just want to give one other example of how we can interpret a story and how that can end up shaping a huge amount of thought that goes out there. Um, so I just recently heard this at another talk, not a TED talk, but that in The Descent of Man, Darwin writes about survival of the fittest apparently twice. But he writes 95 times about the power of love. And that he does write that we are highly competitive beings but that he writes much more about how cooperative we are and how built for empathy we are. Now, this is certainly not the story in the Western world that we've been taught about Darwin. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. I just want to give another story from my two daughters that is about how, how a story, that there's a truth that's deeper in it that's truer than the actual facts in it. So when my two daughters were young, uh, I took them to see The Little Mermaid. And Afterwards, you know, we're talking about it, and I said, you know, these are based, this was the Disney movie of The Little Mermaid. And someone said, and we were talking about it afterwards, that The Little Mermaid is based on a fairy tale, and we should go look at the real fairy tale. So we looked at the real fairy tale, and in the real fairy tale, um, the mermaid, Ariel, she's swimming around, she has a beautiful tail, and a gorgeous singing voice, and there's a storm, and the prince gets dumped into the sea and she saves him and carries him to land and he falls in love with her. In the real story then, in order for her to be with him, she would have to go onto the land and give up her voice, her singing voice, and every time she walks, she has to give up her tail and at the, the center of her, she um, feels pain like it's slicing of knives. She agrees to this and says, okay, I'll give up my voice and I'll go on the land. And so she does that, and when she's on the land, the prince doesn't even recognize her anymore because she's not the girl in the story. He marries someone else, and she turns into sea foam and dies. That's the real story. That's not the Disney one you saw. 
So we, we saw this, and my older daughter said, why would she do that? Why would she, why would she go and marry the prince? He wasn't even that cute. <laughs> and my younger daughter said, no prince is that cute, which to me is the deeper story, that you shouldn't have to give up who you truly are in your voice in order to be with the person that, who loves you. Um, so the reason I brought a stone is because, actually, I love stones. People who know me, I have stones in my office. When I travel, I always collect stones. When I came back from Scotland, I brought stones. I love the kind of, um, if I could be any kind of other thing, it would be a sculptor like Andy Goldsworthy and do stones. Um, these are some of them in Scotland. And this is what I would do if I could. Um, so anyway, stones have always been around me. And the reason I brought a stone today is actually it leads into something that I really wanted to discuss connected to story. So for a very long time, I thought that in doing a play, writing a play, in directing a play, in understanding my children, in teaching my classes, that the biggest thing I needed to do was figure out the story that was being told. I think it's absolutely deeply, deeply important. But this stone actually was a prop in a play called Cripple of Inishman, uh, written by Martin McDonough. And uh, that stone was carried around by a character in the play. Um, and that play is dark, dark funny. But as we worked on it, I realized how full of sadness that play was. All the characters live on an island. Um, and it hit me during that play that one thing we all possess equally is our loneliness. And even though that play was very funny, we began to investigate it by looking for the ache at the center of each character, and looking for the ache and locating this ache at the center of the play. And even though that's a slightly different thing than just looking for the story, it actually shifted completely the way that I taught, the way that I directed, the way that I wrote, and the way that I began to think about raising children. Um, so I wanted to give you a few other examples of that. After the Cripple of Inishman, um, I was working on another play. This was during a period where my youngest daughter was sick from, she didn't grow or gain weight from five months to nine months. And so this play was written kind of in those liminal hours of four to six in the morning. And uh, over about a period of six weeks, and I was thinking a lot about her illness and my sister, who had had a, an extreme childhood illness, also in the effect of that on my family. So I wrote this play as a way to understand these kind of bewildering events and parenthood and loss and illness. And when it came time for it to be produced, I assumed that I needed a director who had the same story I did, who understood parenthood, who understood children, who had, was a parent and um, you know, was a father or something like that. And the director that was suggested to me um, at the time, he wasn't that well known. He's now kind of a big deal director. But um, at the time, he was sort of known um, for musical theater. This seemed very different for the play that I was doing. Um, he was gay. He was not a parent. And I thought, well, this isn't the right person. And when we got together to talk about it, I asked him, why do you want to do my play? And he said, well, there's a line at the center of your play that a character says, loss is what defines us. And he started talking about the loss of all the friends and people in his life from AIDS. And I realized then that he connected to my play in a completely different way than I wrote it. And that was great. <laughs> and he actually directed it beautifully. And it hit me then, I don't need someone who brings the same thing that I bring. I need someone who brings some kind of ache and connects somehow. And it actually changed the way that I thought about collaborators and partnering. Another project um, that I worked on a few years ago, actually at this university, was I directed a production of Elephant Man. And I kind of, you probably know this from the film about John Merrick and the Elephant Man. And I got kind of jazzed on it because I thought, oh, I have the opportunity to have a huge cast. And I knew that I wanted to do something kind of steampunk, uh, industrial looking, uh, Cirque du Soleil. And so for the first part of working on this, I was very jazzed by how it was going to look. And I was thinking a lot about, um, I think I have one of these. This is our pinheads that sort of Cirque du Soleil 
actors in it. And I was actually, it wasn't as we got into still in pre-production, I started to think, go deeper, go deeper into what you want to do, why you want to do this play now. And I started to think about the stuff in the play about a character who feels like a freak, who feels not worth loving, um, and how all the characters in the play actually feel like freaks in different ways and how most people do. And it actually ended up shaping the design, especially of the costumes, because we ended up using the steampunk thing to that all of the characters in it had some element to their costume that was metallic, steampunky, or freakish. And some of them, it was hidden. You know, they were played a doctor, but when they took off the jacket, their whole back was covered in some kind of metallic implement. And, in, and we didn't just put this on the actors. The, what we did is actually ask the actors to kind of tell me, tell me where you are most haunted. Tell me how your character most aches. And that's where we'll put it in the costume. And it actually shifted, I thought, that the play became not just about the elephant man, but it became about the ways in which we all feel deeply lonely, feel like freaks, are worried about our bodies, and have an ache inside. I guess the last play I want to talk about that uh, is a more recent one is a project called Stay that I worked on with, um, I collaborated and conceived it with a, a, a choreographer and dancer, Susan Shields, who actually teaches here. And then it was built with a group of dancers, actors, filmmakers, and designers. And it's called Stay because as we were first talking about it, the idea of the fact of impermanence, of ideas of wanting people to stay the same or wanting things not to change, these were on our minds, this idea of impermanence. And for a long time, we were working on it. I couldn't get hooked in. I, I knew that I could make something kind of cool, but I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't really kind of dig into it. During that same time in my life, my oldest daughter had really plunged into the, I don't know how to say it, the dark well of addiction. She was estranged from our family for months at a time. We wouldn't know where she was. And I was obsessively reading the prodigal son story, looking for clues, you know, and looking at that Rembrandt painting of um, the prodigal son that is so beautiful. And that story and what it is to be the person's outside loving someone that you cannot save was the way in. And actually, it's not what the whole play is about, but the climax and the core of it for me actually were. Um, this is actually the set for the world of it. It took place uh, on a beach in Scotland, lots of stones again. And uh, this actually is a, a character. She's a dancer, um, who Kaylin from, who was inspired a bit by the daughter, um, my older daughter. And then uh, the other piece that really um, as I said, this idea of what it is to love someone who's drowning that you cannot save, infused. And the other person that I most wrote the play about, this is the mother in the play, um, is what it is to be the sibling. Um, and uh, Andrew Hawkins played the brother. And that was, a, you know, so that relationship. And I felt like from that point on, that piece deepened for me. And um, I noticed that the response that we got from audience that even though if they might not have that exact story, that many people have a story of loving someone who's drowning in some way or another, or that feeling of how can I save someone who is plummeting to some place. Um, I've been thinking a lot. A few years ago, I saw an exhibit, some of you might have seen it, of these broken Tibetan bowls. And these bowls, it was at the Sackler Gallery. So these bowls were one time owned by a holy monk in Tibet. And in later centuries, they were dropped and cracked and in shards. But they were considered too precious and valuable to just throw away. So they were repaired, not with glue, which never really holds, but with a seam of gold solder. And these bowls are considered more valuable and precious because of the crack and the brokenness within. And I think that's what our stories are and our ache, that actually what is most precious and valuable about us is not just our story, but the ache that we carry in us 
and that it's the ache that connects to others. Just like those bowls that can be repaired, I think that understanding that is a way to repair the world. Uh, some years ago, George Carlin gave a brilliant, I won't go into his whole bit because it's George Carlin's, but he gave a talk called uh, World Peace Through Formal Introductions. And his idea was that if everyone in the world was introduced formally to everyone else and met them and learned their name and said hello, that that would lead to world peace. And I would just add to that that if they actually sat down and talked to that person and knew their story and maybe one or two things that was about how they ached inside, if they knew a story about tell me about your father's hands or tell me a story about the first time you were kissed or tell me a story about a time you lost everything or what is it like for you when you can't sleep through the night or any of these stories that it would be very hard to then shoot that person be very hard to rape his daughter, be very hard to go to wars with those people because we've met them, we know their story, they may look different than us, but there's a lot more in common than separate. We live in a time where just about every corner of the globe is at war. The atrocities we hear, we're almost in atrocity overload when we read the news or watch things. The things that we're hearing about and most of these, I've heard people say that the biggest problem with all of this is that we are in a, an extremely tribal time, that we're in small groups, that we think we are very different and, from others, and that the ways that these atrocities can be committed is that we manage in our heads to make somebody else other, whether it's people who are a different culture, a different religion, whether they're different uh, sexuality, gender, whatever, that they we're making them into other and it gives us enough distance to be able to do something horrific. When I teach my classes, um, I always end with some kind of ritual. And when I've traveled recently, if I've been to Mexico or Rome or haven't been there in a while, or Italy, uh, Scotland, India, Ireland. Um, when I can, I bring stones back. And sometimes I give them to my students um, at the end of the class. And often we have rituals that we share a poem, we tell stories, um, I send them off with quotes. But the idea is in that last class or workshop is to end with some kind of celebration of each other's stories and a recognition that we know a little bit about each other's ache. And usually by the end of the semester, people are pretty bonded, or the end of the workshop. I like to think about if from Darwin we had been taught from the beginning that survival is, survival of the fittest is those who have loved most fiercely. It would be a very different story. Or if we were celebrated because we were the, had the most empathy. Or we were a culture that was you know, fantastic at mercy, this ability to enter into the chaos of another. What a different story we would be in than this highly competitive world that we live in. I want to tell just one last story that's also from Stay. Near the end of the play, four of the men go to a pub and drink a lot and tell stories. Um, they talk about the losses in their lives. They talk about how they're failing the women in their lives. They talk about God. They talk about faith, loss of faith. And at one point, one of the men staggers outside and they decide to go outside and there's a big mackerel sky over top of them. And they start to look up and ask and wonder if there's anyone out there listening to them, if there's a God, if there's presence, if we have guardian angels. And one says to the other, while looking up, and this is the one who's drunk and fallen asleep with his head on that stone. <laughs> he looks up and says, I don't know, but maybe, just maybe, we are each other's angels. Thank you. <laughs>